So this is the Alpine 12 passive CPU cooler. What passive pretty much means is that it's meant to cool your CPU without a fan. It's literally just one big block of metal. And how does it work? Well, what it's supposed to do is send the heat generated from the CPU right up into those fins, and from there the heat will just go away. Heat rises, and if there's good airflow in the case, that'll kind of accelerate that process. So what I wanna do in this video is test out three different 10th generation processors and put it up against this passive CPU cooler. And we're gonna start out with the Intel Celeron G5900. And as you would imagine, the Celeron doesn't really produce that much heat. It has two cores, two threads, a max clock of 3.4 gigahertz, and a TDP of 58 watts. Now that 58 watts TDP rating is actually pretty significant because if we go ahead and look at the specs for the Arctic Alpine 12 passive cooler, it's only rated for a heat output of 47 watts. And if you're unsure of what TDP means, well, it stands for thermal design power. And it's really just a number that rates how much heat a computer chip outputs. So for example, if you have a chip that has a TDP rating of 50 watts, well, you better have a CPU cooler that is made for chips rated 50 watts or less. And it's pretty interesting that this Arctic cooler is only rated for a TDP of 47 watts. If we take a look at the Arctic Alpine 12 passive web page, paired to the stock cooler, you'll only get a six degree difference with an Intel i3-7300T at full load. And as we all know, the stock cooler is included with even Intel i9s with TDPs of 65 watts. So today we're gonna dive pretty deep and see the real capabilities of this passive cooler. But first, I wanna talk about the sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. Now, Raid Shadow Legends is a game currently celebrating its second birthday and with birthdays come gifts, and Raid has a whole bunch of free stuff that you can get if you download it today. And with Raid Shadow Legends, there's two big things that I really love. No, not, not that. Okay, the first main thing I love about Raid is it's not gonna confuse the crap out of you. I'm sure you've seen other turn-based games, and usually their interfaces have buttons literally everywhere, but with Raid, you not only have a simple and reasonably designed layout of buttons, but they actually tell you what they do. Check this out. When I press and hold down on this turn button, it tells me exactly what it does. The second main thing I noticed that's great about Raid Shadow Legends, you get to choose what you wanna do in its massive world. Play the campaign to get loads of XP and silver, join a clan, hop into a PVP arena battle, that is all up to you. And since they're celebrating their two year anniversary, there's tons of stuff to do. Six straight weeks of anniversary events and tournaments running from March 1st all the way through the middle of April with instant prizes to win. And clan versus clan tournaments are coming too. And a huge head start is waiting for you. Hit the link in the description or scan my QR code and you will receive the free epic champion Jotun, 100,000 silver, 50 gems, and three ancient shards, which allow you to summon some sick champions when you get into the game. Right here is where you can find the treasure. And hey, I'm playing Raid 2 and you can totally add me. Find me in-game under the name Lord Rutech. And if you're quick enough, you can join my clan. So just click the link in the description and I will see you in-game. So let's begin. Let's start with getting the G5900 in its socket. Now something we really need to keep in mind here is the G5900 is one of the cheapest 10th generation Intel processors that you can pick up right now, 42 bucks. For the first test, I am going to be using the pre-applied thermal paste that comes with a passive cooler. Just wanted to let you guys know because it looks like I'm putting on the cooler without any thermal paste. And installation is pretty easy. All you need to do is seat the screws right where you would typically slide in the cooler backplate. And then you fasten it just like normal in an X pattern. Top left, bottom right, top right, bottom left, until the screws are pretty snug. And just so you guys know, for this test bench, I'm using the Thermaltake AH T200 Micro ATX case with two intake 120 millimeter fans and two outtake 120 millimeter fans. I wanted to use something that was kind of bare bones, but not too bare bones to the point where I can't control the airflow. So let's get started testing out this fanless CPU cooler. AS Rock, literally the cheapest motherboard that I could find on Amazon. That doesn't really matter. We're still gonna get pretty much the exact same results as we would using a higher end motherboard in terms of thermal performance. So let's check out the idle temperature. A nice and cool 27 degrees Celsius. Definitely not the biggest surprise. This is a Celeron processor. It's not under any stress. So let's put it under some stress and see how it really performs. So I went ahead and clicked MSI Combuster, clicked on its CPU burner option, and what CPU burner fundamentally does is it pushes your CPU to its limits. And you can definitely tell because once I click start, the CPU usage graph to the right is gonna shoot straight up to 100%. 
So then I let this run for a whole hour. And over the course of that hour, the CPU only hit a maximum of 44 degrees Celsius. And if we're looking at it realistically, CPU utilization being at 100% for a whole hour, at least in day-to-day -day use, that isn't gonna happen. But even hypothetically, if it did, the CPU would still stay at perfectly safe temperatures and gaming doesn't take up 100% CPU utilization 100% of the time. So let's say you were building a super, super low-end PC using the seller on G5900. Well, it seems that this Arctic Passive 12, whatever it's called, cooler is a great option if you want a quieter PC. But as for the higher-end Intel 10th generation CPUs like i5s, well, let's find out. I went ahead and shut off the PC, cleaned up the cooler, the CPU, using my usual method, coffee filters, and 91% isopropyl alcohol. Popped out that Celeron CPU and put in the i5 10400F. Definitely a significant upgrade. It's not like we're going up the ladder from Celeron to Pentium to i3 to i5. No, we're going straight to the i5. So we're gonna see some serious differences here with the i5 10400F. Almost four times the price uh, the Celeron is $42, right? Uh, six cores, 12 threads, max clock of 4.3 gigahertz, and a TDP of 65 watts. And remember, our Alpine 12 is only rated for 47 watts. So boot up the PC, open up MSI Afterburner, and the idle temperature is hovering in the 26, 27, 28 range. But that's only the idle temperature. We gotta push this thing to its limits, just like we did with the Celeron. So I once again started up CPU burner and the temperature as expected shot straight up, but this time it did not stop or even slow down. And in this clip, I have the video sped up to 64 times. And as you can see, that CPU temperature is on a steady, steady rise. And then it hit 90 degrees and I just decided to shut it down. There was no reason for me to be running it anymore. We can definitely conclude that the i5 10400F should never be used at 100% utilization with a passive CPU cooler. And in day-to-day -day use, that's really not gonna be happening. Even gaming, you're not gonna get 100% CPU utilization all the time if you're gaming. So how does the i5 hold up against gaming and stuff of that sort? Well, I threw it in the ring for light gaming, so first Minecraft, it did perfectly fine. As a matter of fact, while playing Minecraft, it never even touched 60 degrees Celsius. But with Apex Legends, it's a little bit of a different story. When playing Apex, the CPU usage ranged from 30 to 60%. And I was playing with all maxed out settings using the 5700 XT I have. And the CPU stayed at a perfectly safe temperature. Yes, you would get a much lower temperature if you were using something like the Hyper 212 or even the Intel stock cooler, but you really don't have to. This is not an overclockable CPU. And if you're gonna exclusively use an i5 10400F for gaming using a dedicated graphics card or other types of light usage like watching YouTube videos or doing homework, you can actually use this silent cooler. Do I recommend it? No, but if you want a more silent experience when you're gaming or doing anything on your computer, it's a valid option. And remember, it took a whole six minutes straight of 100% CPU utilization for the 10400F to hit that danger zone of 80 degrees Celsius. And now for the final CPU that we're gonna test out, the i5 10600K. So I went through the same process of dismantling the PC, cleaning up the CPU after removing the heatsink, and I replaced our i5 10400F with the 10600K. And the 10600K has a TDP of 125 watts, just about double the TDP of the 10400F. So I don't blame you if you don't have the highest of hopes for this 10600K when paired with a fanless CPU cooler. But you know what? Let's test it anyway. As expected, the computer boots right up so let's take a look at that idle temperature. And right off the bat, we can tell that it's way more toasty than the 10 400s idle temperature. But that doesn't matter, we're still gonna run this thing under the ultimate test and see how long it can last with a passive CPU cooler. And within its first 15 seconds of the stress test, it already hits 80 degrees Celsius. And then when it hit 85 degrees, it throttled back down to 3.8 gigahertz. And even with that pretty significant decrease in its clock speed, it still went to 90 degrees Celsius after 12 minutes. But of course, that's running a stress test. What if we did some gaming? It still doesn't look too good. So while playing Minecraft, I'm not too sure why, but the CPU didn't decide to thermal throttle, even though it hit 85 degrees multiple times. But I'm pretty confident that even if it did throttle, it would still be hovering in a pretty unsafe temperature range. So we can certainly conclude that passive CPU coolers are not meant for mid to high end CPUs. 
This doesn't mean they're useless. They're definitely useful if you want a silent PC when you're using a lower end CPU, like the Celeron Pentium i3, and apparently even the 10400 if you're never using it at 100% utilization. But you know, no matter the circumstances, I'm probably still gonna always recommend that you have a cooler with a fan. But yeah, that will wrap it up for today's experiment type video. It was pretty fun learning about how well a passive CPU cooler can cool modern day CPUs. Hopefully you also learned a thing or two. If you enjoyed the video, drop a like. Have any comments or questions, drop a comment below. And if you enjoy the content that you're seeing, drop a sub. Thanks for watching. Peace out.